Hey everybody, welcome to Rampage Reviews. I'm Rampage and we're back to the last High Republic book after the last one. So this is the last one. The next one will then be the last one also. So let's dive in. So today we're reviewing Temptation of the Force in the High Republic. This book was written by Tessa Gratton. It takes place in 228 BBY, just one year after the events of Eye of Darkness, which was the last, last High Republic book that we reviewed. I thought that was the last one, but this one came out this year. So we're going back to read this one. And as books come out, I might go back and read the new book that came out to stay in chronological order because I can't not do that. My OCD won't allow me to. Just want to remind everybody that if you would like to purchase the book that I reviewed today, there will be a link in the description to do so. Just be aware that that is an Amazon link and I am an Amazon affiliate and if you use that link to purchase the book it will benefit me or the channel in some way but don't do it to benefit me I really appreciate it if you do but do it so we can continue this conversation and because you want to get my take and then offer your take as well in response and also be aware that the links that are provided will be for this book and the next three books that I will be reviewing so you can get a jump on what I'm going to be reviewing into the future and also make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you like the content that you saw today also I took the time to type up a quick disclaimer so you may pause the video now to read the disclaimer below I enjoyed the book it was decent it wasn't the best one I read and it wasn't the worst one I read. It was just eh, right in the middle. Let's dive in a little bit to the overview. So basically we're catching up to everybody a year after Avar Chris was stuck in the occlusion zone with the Nihil and the storm wall is constantly growing. Marchie and Roe just keeps expanding the border of the storm wall every time, basically every time the Republic shows any kind of aggression towards them at all. So that keeps growing and Avar is currently trying to find a way to get back into Republic space outside of the storm wall so that way she can meet back up with the Republic, the Jedi, and more importantly, Elzar because her and Elzar have this unspoken romance attraction to each other, which is forbidden because they're Jedi and that kind of leads them more into it because they're all pent up and they have this emotion and they want to let it out, but they can't. So it's just even exacerbated. So she finds a way to get out of the occlusion zone. I think it has to do with tricking the storm wall into thinking that it's using a good path code, which that's the way that Nihil get inside and outside of the occlusion zone is they use path engines, which have special codes to them and it creates special hyperspace paths for them. Something that's always been a trait of theirs throughout their description in the High Republic books is they, these path engines. That's their identity, basically. That and Wreck Punk Rock, so they love that too. And while the storm wall keeps expanding and the occlusion zone is this point of no return, it seems like, for a lot of people, and there's a lot of people trying to get out of the occlusion zone, the Republic is diplomatically trying to reason with the Nihil, uh, with the Nile. Sorry, I say Nihil. I've been saying Nihil every time, and I think I realized recently that it's Nile. It's not Nihil, it's Nile. Like N-I-L-E, basically. I was doing it wrong the whole time, and I am sorry, but it's Nile. The Nile have basically been themselves, but the Republic have kind of been diplomatic with them, and they have meetings with Giristaros, which is their Minister of Information, the Niles Mis Minister of Information. And she is kind of meeting in good faith really because Marching Rowe hasn't really changed the way that he is. He's still sadistic and he's kind of displaced, but he's discarded his former position. He's not that involved to the government part of the Nile. He's just trying to search for ways that he can increase his power, increase his control over his area and keep the Republic off his back basically. And lately in this book, he has found something called the Blight. And he thinks it has something to do with the presence of Drengear on different planets, which the Drengear was this spread and it had dark side energy and it could attack people and into their hearts and minds and that kind of thing. Kind of like the Nameless, not such a extreme case with Jedi that the Nameless are, but he's going over these planets and finding this blight from places, which is this plague that keeps overtaking just certain parts of the land. It's literally like moving like water over living things and it's killing off vegetation, people, animals. The good part is for the most part, the blight does not exist on planets that are highly civilized or highly populated, I should say, mainly on planets that don't have a lot of people or any people. And he's trying to find the cause of it and where it came from. And he's having a lot of trouble doing that. But in the time that he's researching it and getting in touch with it, he realizes that he's immune to its effects. I don't know how that happens, but he becomes immune to its effects. Can't remember reading it if the Nameless are too, because he has two Nameless that follow him around everywhere. I can't remember if they are too or if they succumb to their effects. I believe they're also being with him makes them not really succumb to their effects either. But that's kind of what he's doing throughout this entire book is researching this blight and figuring out how we can use that to his advantage, how we can control it and how we can use it against the Republic in some way. The end really gets into a turn of events and we'll get to that later. Avar Chris, when she gets back to the Republic space, then she has to teach everybody how to perform this technique that she did for to get through the storm wall. And they actually end up coming up with a device that helps them get past the storm wall. And it does exactly what she was trying to do, but it takes a Jedi to do it because you have to enter these codes very precisely, very quickly. And only Jedi have the 
the state of mind to do it. So she teaches people how to do it and they go on missions to try to recover people from the occlusion zone and bring them back to the Republic space. And Elzar also takes part in some of these missions. At one point, they have the help of uh, someone named Kerr Santeca, who is a part of the Nile, worked for the Nile. He worked on this ship called the Lightning Crash, I think it was called. And that was like the main ship that powered the Stormwall. And they were able to destroy it. And they thought it was kind of easy, a little too easy, but they were able to destroy it. And they knew that wouldn't completely take it down, but it would extremely weaken it. And the Stormwall would come down for a period of time, which would presumptively allow them to bring in a large force of Republic ships and try to attack Marching Row or the Nile government, which they aren't completely successful with. The Stormwall went back up way quicker than they thought it would. And they are able to find Marching Row, though, later in the book. Porter Angle makes a comeback in the book. We thought he was dead in the last book, but he actually survived the explosion on the ship that he was fighting General Vias on. That's basically what he's doing throughout the whole book is looking for her and fighting her and stuff like that. It's that's the thing with this book is there's a lot of this is what we need to do and this is how we can do it and like building up that and planning and discussing the plan and then like they kind of take part in some of the plan but then something goes wrong and okay now we got to regroup here's more of the plan we got to build up this plan it's like a lot of transitional stuff and I don't feel like anything major takes place in this book the most major thing that takes place is when they find Marchian Row and they start attacking him and the Nameless and also some of the Jedi are able to survive the presence of the Nameless Viriaga is like caught in one of the Nameless's like little mind traps that they put him in where they instill a lot of fear in their mind and they're just like frozen and almost blind in that kind of sense that they can't move they can't see they all they see is the fear and these images that they instill in their mind well Viriaga is able to get that fear passed through him that's the Wookiee Jedi in the book he's able to find the location of the nameless based on where that fear is coming from so then he is able to, to detect that and throw his lightsaber at the nameless which was pretty crazy and then later they find if they link up mentally together and use the force together mentally then they can gather enough strength in the force to pull the fear away from the person that's being attacked so that person can then attack the nameless so the Jedi actually are able to come up with a, a tactic against the nameless so due to this stuff you are able to fight them a little bit better which is good the nameless are still pretty formidable they don't completely take them out they still exist they still present a huge threat to the Jedi and at the end of the book Marjorie and Ro sets up a meeting with the Chancellor he brings the nameless with him to Coruscant and this was after he got attacked by the Jedi on one of the last planets that he found the blight on he goes there with a little sample of the blight that he found he took like a handful of it and he brings a little sample with him the Chancellor basically tells him to stay on the landing pad because he's like that's as far as you're gonna go we're not gonna talk in my office or anything we're gonna talk out here on the landing pad what did you come here to say he tells him there's a large blight that's dangerous to me to you to the entire galaxy and we need to take care of it i have a way to destroy it i know where it comes from i know how to control it and i'm going to at first they kind of think he's threatening them but then they realize oh he's trying to tell us that he's going to take care of it but he also has a demand to do it he's going to do it anyway but he has a demand to it and we don't really know exactly what that demand is yet they kind of leave off he throws the sample of blight on the ground and he, he says i don't think you understand yet that i am your only hope obviously he's going to use that to his advantage going forward and whatever the next book is i forget it's in a list of the canon books so like i said it's a really interesting series of plans and research and what they need to do going forward but it didn't feel like there was anything majorly no major event that changed the course of where the republic was going with the exception of the discovery of the blight that's the biggest thing how are they going to take care of this blight and what how are they going to further fight the nameless going forward oh and also porter angle has been on the search for his sister for the longest time and general via says i know where your sister is and they leave off with that too so there's something that's triggers a lot of people with Star Wars and especially the new Disney Star Wars and the High Republic and stuff that's come out recently and it has to do with woke or the LGBTQ inclusion stuff this it's not like this book dives hard into it there's probably other books that kind of do a little bit more I know there was one book that I read that used they them pronouns which was no big deal you like noticed it and then it's put out of your mind but this one there's a there's a couple of like Kara Santeca and then Xylan Graf uh, and those two families also are like I think they're major rivals of each other the Santecas and the Grafs but those two guys are they're they're husband and husband they're a gay couple and there's a couple other people in the book that are a gay couple also so they it's like two major couples of people are gay couples which you read it and it's there and it doesn't really affect the story the good news of it is okay if you're a part of that community it represents you and you're probably really excited that you get to read that and that it's a part of it if you're not a part of that community some people are triggered by it they don't want to read it other people are like it doesn't really affect the story why do i care it's not something i'm going to hang on to i just felt like it was worth talking about because when i read that the stuff is in here it doesn't affect the substance of the story to me if there's no substance to the story and that's what's being focused on that's kind of annoying because you want the focus to be on the conflict and the protagonist and what's going on. If they're focusing majorly on some people's sexuality, it's like, wh who cares? You don't really need to know that. And I also don't care if it's part of the story, as long as the substance is good. I just want to get that out there. If this triggers you, try not counting it as part of the story. Just focus on the substance. Who cares if they're gay or straight or trans or whatever? Who cares? We shouldn't care. Like I said, unless you're part of that community, yay for you. That's great that you get some representation. That's wonderful. For someone like me, it's not something that adds to the story and it doesn't hurt the story either. Neither nor at all. Let's get into the more interesting part that I found in the story. <laughs>
Archie and Roe has been powering the storm wall with false kyber crystals. I know we talked about it in another book where there were synthetic kyber crystals that were made. That was in Mall Lockdown, where they said that the Sith only created lightsabers with synthetic kyber crystals, which we know that's not true. But it's interesting they're able to lab create kyber crystals to power the storm wall. And it makes you wonder, like, why aren't there more shields, more defensive things powered with kyber crystals? Why haven't we seen that? The two major things we've seen powered with kyber crystals are lightsabers and the Death Star weapon. I, I just don't know. There should be more, don't you think? Shouldn't there be more? If you've been following the Acolyte, you'll notice that Master Venestra is also a part of this book. She was 20 in this book, I believe. And you also find out that she is the Padawan of Stellan Geos. That was the Jedi that fell during the Fallen Star. He died. And you don't really see a connection to it in the Acolyte yet. You just find out that's a little piece of trivia that you find out in the book. They don't appear together in the High Republic series. But Stellan was a very respected Jedi. And I'm sure that at some point you'll hear a mention of him in the Acolyte from Master Venestra. There's kind of an ironic point that I find out through this whole High Republic series. This is supposed to be the peak of the Republic, where they're at their strongest. The Jedi are at their highest point. The Republic is strong. They have a great economy. The people are thriving. This is their best time period. And it kind of seems that way when you get into the 372 BBY era with Irim and Irino. Even though they had their little civil war, that's just a small part of what's not in the Republic. And the Republic is supposedly thriving at that point. But then in the 220s and the 230s BBY, the Nihil exists. And maybe this is because this is the end of the High Republic. Maybe that's where it's getting at. I mean, they suggest the Acolyte is the High Republic, so it's obviously not. But the Nihil have this stranglehold on the Republic when it comes to the occlusion zone, the storm wall, and just taking over more and more territory. This does not feel like a high point to me. It just seems like a very ironic way to describe this time period when it doesn't feel like they're at their strongest. In a lot of respects, with the IP that Disney has decided to purchase, they've been decent at creating complex villains. I thought that Thanos was a really complex villain and one of my favorite villains. We have yet to see a really complex villain come out of Disney Star Wars, or at least as complex as Darth Vader, which was not their creation. That was George Lucas's creation. Marching and Rowe is a very shallow villain, and he doesn't come off as complex to me. He just wants power and he gets deeper and deeper into this selfish state where he's just trying to find out how to control more and order people around more. And the Nile was supposed to be this safe haven away from the restrictive Republic where people can do whatever they want. And now you've just got this area where people are not taken care of, they're forgotten about, they're actually having things taken from them, they're taxed like 60 or 70% of their goods and, and their currency. So like, I don't understand the goal here. They just want to leave people starving, but they want to take over and they, they suggest that they have this safe haven of an area, yet people are dying. Doesn't make sense. There's a point in the book where a Republic ship travels through hyperspace and a Nile ship actually follows that Republic ship and is able to find where they travel to also going in hyperspace. And one of the suggested reasons was that maybe the, maybe the Republic ship had a homing beacon on it, which I would feel like they would think that that doesn't matter anyway, because there's no hyperspeed tracking. You can't track someone through light speed, meaning you can't track where, where their coordinates went if they're that far away. And, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe a beacon would still allow you to track it once it landed into a location. Correct me in the comments if you will. But as far as I knew, light speed tracking wasn't possible until we saw The Last Jedi, where they were surprised that it had been created. So what are they talking about? Talked about before that I like the way that different Jedi talk about the Force in different manifestations. Elzar Man thinks it's like an ocean. Avar Chris thinks it's a song. Other people just think it's a Force, just a vibration. But as much as Avar Chris talks about it being a song, she's not musical and she doesn't physically sing. She talks about metaphorically singing with the Force, but she doesn't sing or play an instrument. I don't, or at least you don't hear about it. If the Force is a song and she connects with that so strongly, why isn't she singing or playing instruments? Do you get what I'm saying here? I feel like that should be a thing. One of the original strategies the Jedi came up with are they wanted to have non-Force users fight the Nameless in front of them, kind of like foot soldiers. So the Republic would come in with a non-Force user army in front of them to attack Nameless, while then they would fight other parts of the Nile or whoever they're fighting at the time. Eventually, the Jedi are able to come up with a strategy to help them fight the Nameless more effectively themselves. I thought the strategy of using foot soldiers to do that part first was a really smart one, and it gave them a real chance against the Nameless coming up with that strategy. It's confusing to me how the Republic is actively infiltrating Nile space, destroying the lightning crash, trying to smuggle people through the storm wall away from the occlusion zone, yet Lena So and Giristaros are continually having diplomatic meetings together as if they're just discussing trade or something like that. I don't understand how two entities like that can be at basically large scale war with each other, but then have diplomatic meetings. Is this something that is reflected in real life? I don't know that our leaders would diplomatically meet with other leaders while they're at war. Does that happen? One of the major things in this book is the blight that Margie and Roe discovers and is trying to research and find how to control and find out the source of it. It's described, it acts like a plague over land and living things and stuff like like that. It turns things into an ashy husk, and it's almost exactly the way that the Nameless turn Jedi when they suck the force out of them, basically, and leave them in this dusty, ashy husk. It makes you wonder, like, is this just a lazy way of copying what the Nameless do, or does it have to do with the Nameless? Because we know the Drengir don't leave people like that, they just eat people. So it was weird to come up with another evil thing that comes about that turns things into ashy 
she husks. I don't know. I thought it could have been more original way to like hurt things or a different way to describe how it's hurting things. Talked about how the Jedi came up with a strategy to take the fear away from somebody being attacked by a nameless and they basically just link up mentally together with the force. Whoever's linked up with the one person being attacked, they direct the fear that it's being instilled in them away from that person. I didn't know that was even a thing. You could take someone's fear from them like you're taking their hat off or something like this is a new avenue to discuss what the force can do and we're I don't know how many more things we're going to discover or find that you can manipulate the force, but I'm sure there will be lots of other things. I mean, lots of things have been introduced in Legends on how you can manipulate the force. So this isn't really that different to talk about, you know, different things that you can do. But it was just an interesting way to manipulate it. That is the end of the interesting things that I found. There wasn't a ton in this one compared to other books, aside from the hot button stuff I was talking about with woke stuff, if you will. And I only brought that up because it's a hot button issue, because people keep getting triggered by it. So I just wanted people to understand that when you read any piece of literature or a book or anything like that, the personal stuff in there that has to do with people's identities and stuff like that. It does help describe who the person is and how they might react in certain situations and stuff like that. I don't know that it's something you should hold against any character in the book because it's not there for you if you're triggered by it. It's there for someone who wants to be represented in the book. If you don't want it in there, it's just remember that. It's not for you. Just pay attention to the rest of the story because that's what the story's about and judge it by the story, which a lot of people are good at that too. But a lot of people read stuff and they act like it's attacking them. It's not attacking you. It's just not there for you. With the exception of that, I didn't think the story was all that exciting. Just a bunch of transitions. Porter Angle was constantly looking for General VS to attack her and he attacked her a couple times. They got into fights, but nothing major happened until the end when she said, I found your daughter or your sister. I know where your sister is. I can't remember his sister or daughter, one of those two. And then they were finding ways to pass a storm wall and they did, but then there was like the ultimate way that kind of weakened it, but it's still there. And, and Marchion found the blight, says he knows how to destroy it or control it. And he doesn't actually do it yet. And the nameless are still a big threat, but they found a little bit of an incremental way to fight them. But nothing major it felt like happened in the book. So I gave this book a 7.3. I think that's fair. I wouldn't say it was hard to get through, but for a book that had 420 pages, I thought there would be a little bit more substance and a little bit more major events to take place that really took a turn in the High Republic. Because the turn in terms of when the Nile were really having a stranglehold on, on the Republic happened in the Eye of Darkness. That's when you really took a turn right there. But this one included that, and then it didn't really move way farther than that. Although there was just some incremental progress the Republic made. Fine, maybe they're just trying to lead up to the next book. I don't like books that are fillers between books. Like, that, it shouldn't be that. It should be something major that happened. That's why you released the book because it's something to take note of. I didn't feel like it did that. I appreciate everybody that stopped by to watch the content today and may the force be with you and you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you.